Lord, thank you, Father God, how great thou art. Lord, as we come into your presence this morning, may we just reflect, Jesus, how great you really are. May our hearts go out to you, Lord. May the Holy Spirit fill this room this morning, Lord, as we take your word in, and as we worship you and adore you. Father, as dear Pastor Darren brings us thy word this morning, May our hearts be open to receive it, Lord. May our minds understand. May we truly know the holiness and the greatness of God our Father. Thank you, Lord. For we ask this in your name. Amen. Good morning. Good to see each one of you here this morning and those who might be joining us via our BBC Connect platform. Uh, welcome to you as well. Thank you to our song and music team for just a beautiful, beautiful, worshipful time this morning that brings us into our Advent season. And if you are with us for the first time this morning, it is our joy, our privilege and our pleasure to have you join us. And may God bless you as we continue to worship the Lord together this morning. If you are with us for the first time or if you are fairly new to the church, we have a special designated tea table uh, alongside the main tea table to this side of the hall. And at the end of the meeting this morning, I would love to invite you uh, to come and uh, meet myself and Trevor and a few other members of the church. We would love to just get to know more about you. Uh, and if that's not an appeal enough, there will be cake available. Okay, so if meeting Trevor and I is not appealing, there will at least be some cake for you to enjoy with a cup of tea or coffee. But great to uh, see uh, each of you this morning. And obviously, uh, I want to say welcome to the Tanza men. Uh, so Danny, Frank, it is good to have you guys join us this morning together with, uh, with your dad. And we continue, uh, Tim, to pray for you and your beloved die. And may you continue to know and see God's faithfulness as he walks with you. I have a whole bunch of thanks uh, this morning. So firstly, how, how awesome does the stage look, right? It's just absolutely, absolutely stunning. When Maureen Hundemar came to me a couple of months ago and just shared as it was unfolding, and she wasn't even sure at that time what God was saying to her, and then we chatted this last week, and it's just absolutely amazing. And I am going to ask, uh, I know there are a bunch of ladies who have worked alongside Maureen, I'm going to ask you to stand. The church would like to know. You want to know who's done this, right? Yeah, they want to know, right? So, uh, so please, if you have been a part of what's gone on here, please won't you stand. Thank you, Shane. Shane's the first one to... <laughs> um, please stand. Now, we give you a round of applause. Our grateful, grateful thanks to you ladies. Absolutely Stunning. I said, to, I said to Maureen, I mean, every year is absolutely stunning, but I said to her, how are you going to top this next year? She says, no, I'm just going to pass it on to somebody else. But it's absolutely, absolutely beautiful. And, uh, and Rach, Rach has done the silhouettes. Isn't that great? Good job, Rach. Well done. I said to Rach yesterday, I'm so excited to see what she's going to do for Easter. So well done, Rachel. Good job. Um, 
I also want to just express my gratitude to, uh, to all of those, so Rolene and the whole team who were a part of our Silver Threads uh, tea yesterday. Hands up if you joined us and attended as our honored guests. Okay, so there's some of the hands that are going up. Uh, wasn't that spread amazing? There was just so much food and yeah, it's just so amazing. So if you were a part of that, whether you cooked, whether you came and served, whether you gave financially, I'm going to ask if you can stand. Come on, I know there's more than no one right there. G, come on. Well done. Thank you so much once again to you ladies. Uh, men, where are you, right? But thank you. It's just absolutely, absolutely beautiful. And, uh, and I'm just so grateful. And I know that I mentioned this last week, but I just want to express gratitude and thanks to all of those who were a part of our Mabuku Orphan Party. It was a wonderful and a very, very special day. And uh, I want to say thank you to Adrian and Wadzi for leading that ministry. And it was so wonderful to see families coming out as well. I know the Piri uh, family, they came out as a family. The Mushongas came out as a family. And that's just so encouraging to see our young people stepping up and serving. So um, together with uh, Adrian and Wadzi, if you were a part of that, please won't you stand so that we can just recognize and appreciate you. Come on. Thank you. Well done, and I've been so grateful as I've just reflected this last week on the many, many people who serve in the many, many areas of the life and ministry of Baptist Bible Church. And I just want to express my gratitude uh, to each one of you. And uh, I, I don't know if Laura Mautza is here this morning, but, um, but she, I don't know if rebukes may be too much of a strong word, but she said to me some weeks ago, she said, you know, it's been a long time since you've told us that you love us. So today I want to tell you guys <laughs> that I really do love you. Not just because Laura told me to tell you, okay, but uh, I really do love you guys. And it is a joy, it is an honor, and it is a privilege to be able to serve our Lord alongside each of you. And I am so grateful to the Lord for each of you. Before we get into God's word, I uh, want to say, oh, there he is. I want to say happy birthday to Shane. It is Shane's birthday today. Um, Trevor has got a very special uh, surprise for you. I won't let the secret out now, but please just see Trevor. Okay, where's Trevor? Yeah, he's paying for it. Please tell Trevor he's paying for something, right? Okay, and uh, I'm going to be in trouble for this, but happy birthday to my dear wife. It is her birthday today. You should not have clapped because it's only going to make uh, things worse for me. <laughs> but a very special welcome to each one of you. And it's just exciting to be able to come into this Advent season to sing about how great our God is and that He is worthy. He alone is worthy to be praised. And this morning I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel according to Matthew. And we're going to look at the 11 verses of Matthew chapter 2 as we open up the Advent series this morning. And as we start this series, I want us to be thinking through what I have titled as the gifts of Christmas. And over these next few weeks, we're going to be looking at three gifts of Christmas, not exhaustive by any means, but three gifts of Christmas. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at joy. Lord willing, on December 18th, we're going to be looking at peace. And then, Lord willing, on Christmas morning, we're going to be looking at hope. And so uh, we come to the gifts of Christmas part one as we look at joy. And I'm going to ask if you would bow your heads with me as we pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for your little flock in this part of your vineyard here at Baptist Bible Church. Thank you that you have equipped your church for every good work. And thank you for the men and women, the boys and girls whom you have placed in this fellowship. Thank you for those who serve so faithfully and Jesus, as we come to your word this morning, you alone are worthy of glory, praise, and honor. And I pray as we approach the scriptures, as we approach your word, Father, I humbly ask that you would make our eyes to see and our ears to hear, that you would cause our minds to understand and our hearts to receive your word this morning, that, Lord, uh, we wouldn't miss what you're saying because perhaps uh, of familiarity with the scriptures, but that you would speak by your Holy Spirit, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart 
be acceptable and pleasing to you, my Lord and my God, and that, Father, I would be nothing, that Jesus is the author of the Scriptures, that you would be everything this morning to the praise of your glorious grace, Lord Jesus. Amen. So the heart of the message this morning is this, church, that Jesus came to bring joy unspeakable. Jesus came to bring joy uncontainable. Jesus came to bring joy unimaginable, really, when we think about the vastness of the joy which Jesus has brought to this world. And let me start out by saying that this time of the year, that word joy comes up a lot. Okay, we see it printed in Christmas cards and well wishes from uh, people that send newsletters out. Uh, we see it up in shop windows. We even sang about the joy that has come to the world. And, uh, and so we, we walk through the supermarkets and we hear of this joy uh, that has come to the world. But really, joy seems to be that thing which everybody is looking for, and yet it seems to be so elusive, okay? seems to be so hard to find. And because we desire joy so badly, we tend to search for it in so many different places. We search for it in our wealth, we search for it in our possessions, we search for it in ways of fame and popularity and work. But what happens when joy is not found in these different places? What happens when joy is elusive in these different places? We're left thinking to ourselves, there has got to be more to life than this. And so we are led to ask that probing question this morning, can joy really be found? Can joy really be found? And if so, then how? And so this morning we're going to go along a journey with a group of men known as the wise men or the, the magi. And as we go with them this morning, we're going to see and ask ourselves that question, can true joy really be found? And so I invite you to follow with me in your Bibles as we open the gospel account in Matthew chapter 2, and we'll read real quickly verses 1 through to 11. And starting from verse 1, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, yes, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all of the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And so they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And verse 7, And then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me, that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. As we come to the Synoptic Gospels, each of the, the four writers present Jesus Christ in uniquely different ways. So he's still Lord, he's still Sovereign, he's still Savior, but he is presented in different ways. In Matthew, he is the Sovereign One who comes to rule and reign. In the Gospel of Mark, he is the Servant who comes to serve and suffer. In the Gospel according to Luke, he is the Son of Man who comes to share and to sympathize. And then as we come to the gospel according to John, he is the Son of God who comes to reveal and to redeem. And so as we come to the gospel of Matthew, Matthew presents Jesus Christ as the sovereign one, right? And I said the sovereign one who comes to rule and reign. And I want you to pay attention because this is important. He's presenting Jesus Christ as king. And this is going to be important to the context of our passage this morning. 
And so in the passage of Scripture that we, that we are examining this morning, we're in, introduced to the Magi. We're introduced to these wise men. So we've got to ask ourselves the question, well, who were these guys, right? So the Magi were a, a group of people who originally came from a larger group of people known as the Medes. Okay, the Magi were very high-ranking officials, and in fact, they almost held a priest-type of position amongst uh, the Medes, the same way as the Levites held a priestly position amongst God's people, the Jews, right? And so through the years, they had risen to a great prominence in the kingdoms of Persia, uh, Media, and Babylon. All right, these men would have known and they would have learned, it would have been passed down to them about the coming Messiah through people like Daniel and others who had been brought into their country under captivity and would have talked about this king who was to come. And so these men were the official, and we need to pay attention to this, they were the official kingmakers of the great, the great empire to the east of Israel And listen, it was their business to recognize and to coronate kings. That was the importance about the Magi. It was their job to recognize and to coronate kings. Okay? And so they they begin this journey. They receive this information. They've heard it passed down through Daniel. And they've received this information of this king who would be born. And so they undertake a journey of about 1,200 to 1,500 kilometers. Now, that's, that is a long distance by today's standards, but you talk about back then and their mode of transport. This was a, a great task to undertake. And so we may read the scriptures rather flippantly and casually, but imagine these guys hopping on their camels and they leave everything that is familiar to them and they go on a journey for months. And we know that it took a long time because by the time, as the story unfolds today, they get to Jesus, we no longer find a baby, we find a child, not in a manger, but in a house. And so these men undertake this long, arduous journey in search of the king, all right? And so they leave their homes, they leave their families, they leave their comforts, they leave their familiarity, and there is a burning question in their hearts and their minds, and the question is this, where is he who has been born king of the Jews, okay? Not just where is he who has been born, not just where is he who has been born a king, where is he who has been born the king of the Jews, a king like no other king. And we're talking about pagan guys, you know, who were trying to figure out, we're talking about these astrologers and these astronomers, and they're saying, where is he? We've heard about this man who would be born king of the Jews, a messianic term for the Messiah. And so they walk around and they ask this question, and they, they're walking around Jerusalem, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? And can you imagine how perplexed and baffled they were as they looked upon the faces of, of people, and, and they just had these blank looks. And they're thinking, surely you guys should know. You are his own chosen people. The prophets of old spoke about this. Surely you should know where is he who has been born king of the Jews. And they turn around and they say, for we have seen his star in the east and we have come to worship him. Where is he? And as the story unfolds, news gets to Herod the king. He is troubled with all of Jerusalem. He gathers the priests and the scribes together and he says, tell me, where will this Christ be born? And they say, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And it really struck me as these uh, wise men rode into town and they said, man, where is he who is born king of the Jews? That surely it would have got the interest of God's people. And yet not one person said, you know what? We're going to go with you. Have you ever thought about that? Not one person said, we're going to go with you to go find this king because we've been waiting in anticipation. Not one person says, we'll go with you. And so we meet a very troubled and a very panicked and a very agitated King Herod because a bunch of Persian kingmakers have come riding into town asking, where is he who is born king of the Jews? And he knows that if this is true, this means bad news for him. Because Herod already knew that he was unpopular and disliked. And if there was a new king, if there was a king of the Jews, it would mean an end to his career. 
It wouldn't take much for, uh, for the zealots to arise and for the fanatics to arrive and to overthrow him by a great uprising. But Herod wasn't the only one who was afraid. What does the Bible say? Who else was afraid? All of Jerusalem together with him. Have you ever wondered why all of Jerusalem was afraid? I mean, they should have been rejoicing, right? But they were afraid together with Herod. Well, it's because Herod instilled fear within them. Their fear of Herod was greater than their faith in God. But there's something more to that that caused these people to be afraid. You see, while Herod may have had, if you study history, he had a fair number of achievements and successes and accomplishments, but he was a maniac of a, of a, of a man. He was a madman. And Herod knew how disliked he was, and he knew that the day that he died, there would be no mourning for him in Jerusalem. And so history would tell us that he left instruction that on the day that I die, he says, you get all the important people in Jerusalem, and you kill them. And that way, I'll ensure that there is mourning in Jerusalem. And so all of Jerusalem was afraid, because they knew if this was true, and Herod was about to be overthrown from his throne, guess what for them? Well, that's the death of us. And that's why they were so afraid. So the Bible says, And then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him only. What a lying, conniving, evil hypocrite. He had no intention. And we know how the story goes, right? Herod is so afraid and agitated that he sends out a decree, he sends out instruction that every child, two, every male child, two years and younger, is put to death. He wants to make sure that he puts an end to the life of the Messiah. And so, and when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, how did they know where to go? You say, well, they, they followed, I mean, Micah made it clear, they followed the prophets, right? How did they know where to go? Star, right? How did they know which route to take? I mean, but we say the star, but there were thousands of stars in the sky. Which one do we pick, right? How did they know which star to follow? Well, I want you to pay attention here because this is important, church. You see, these wise men didn't just follow some random star in the sky. But I want you to take note of something. On them inquiring, where is he who is born king of the Jews? What do they say? For we have seen, for we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Okay? Not we have seen a star. We have seen his star. Now pay attention because this is important. What was the star which the wise men saw and followed? Was it a star that was a, a special star of stars which God created and said, I'm going to put an extra big star here for you to follow. I don't believe that it was just another star. There's something important about the fact that the scriptures say it was his star. Now there are differing views about the star. Some see it as nothing more than just a star. Don't make anything more of it. Some suggest that it was Jupiter which is known as the king of of the planets others believe that it was a conjunction of jupiter and saturn others hold a view that uh, it was just a comet and some say it was just a low-hanging meteor okay so you got to decide for yourself which one fits but we need to go to another passage of scripture to understand what is going on here when they follow his star it takes us to luke chapter 2 and verse 9 a well-known account of the christmas story as the shepherds are out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And here's what the scriptures say. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And in the midst of this very dark night, there is this piercingly brilliant light, and the Bible tells us this light was the glory of the Lord. Now stay with me, okay? As we study the scriptures over and over and over again, we find that the glory of the Lord is always manifest in light. Are you guys still with me? We're going to explain the star, right? Just stay with me. As God led the children through the wilderness, the glory of the Lord appeared to them as a cloud by day and as a pillar of fire by night. 
when the glory of God descended upon the tabernacle, it manifests itself in light. When we talk about the transfiguration, the Mount of Transfiguration, and Jesus shone in brilliant light. Okay, when Moses went up on the mountain and he requested, Lord, show me your glory, what does God say? He says, you actually cannot look upon my face, but I'll take you and I'll hide you in the cleft of a rock and then I'll put my hand over you and I will walk past and after I've walked past, you can see my back. And just that was enough for Moses that when he came down from the mountain with the tablets of stone, his face shone in brilliant light because he had beheld glory so whenever we see the presence of God we see a manifestation of light that light is known as the Shekinah glory of God is a visible manifestation of divine presence right the star <laughs> let me first say this in Matthew chapter 24 verse 29 to 30 it tells us what will happen after the days of tribulation the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. In other words, God will turn everything out. And then the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And so once again, God will turn the lights out in all of creation, and then suddenly there will be this manifestation of glory in the heavens as the Son of Man descends upon the earth. So whenever the Son of Man shows up, there's always going to be a sign that is pointing to Him. And so what I believe that the wise men saw in the sky was the glory of the Lord. It was the star of the God-man when heaven's deity stepped into earth's humanity. It wasn't just some kind of star. It wasn't Jupiter. It wasn't Saturn. It was a manifestation of the Shekinah glory of God. Isn't that exciting? There wasn't just a star. It wasn't a star like all other stars that will go out in time. It was a manifestation of the glory of God. That's why it wasn't a star. It was His star. Did you guys get that? In the Greek, it's asteri, but in the, the word is asteri, but in the Hebrew, the word is kochav, for star. Now get a hold of this. A prophecy that was uttered by a pagan by the name of Balaam back in the book of Numbers said this he said i see him but not now i behold him but not near a star Chochav, shall come out of jacob a scepter shall rise out of israel and this Chochav that balaam was prophesying about is none other than the glory of god incarnate lighting up the sky and leading the magi to the exact point in time spoken about years before the shekinah glory of god imagine that moment so if you've been thinking of little twinkle twinkle stars up in the sky there man that is nothing compared to the glory we're talking about that took place that day imagine how incredibly awesome that must have been to witness I still don't get that no one went with them. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Did you guys get that? Before they even get to the house, before they even see the God child, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy because they knew that something was going down in Jerusalem. They knew that something had gone down in Bethlehem. And they rejoiced not just with joy. They rejoiced not just with great joy. They rejoiced with what? Exceedingly great joy. Because they knew that on the other side of that brilliant light, there was the king. On the other side of the brilliance of glory, there was the king. Remember the job of the Persian king makers was to what? to recognize and to coronate kings. 
And they knew that their mission was about to be accomplished. The words of the prophet Micah echoing down the corridors of time, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the, the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, where, uh, whose goings forth are from of old and from everlasting. And so many other uh, words of prophecy echoing down the corridors of time as the story was unfolding for the Magi that day. And then as the Apostle John reports in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word, Jesus, became flesh, God incarnate, and dwelt tabernacled amongst us there is so much that is packed in that verse right there and so these persian king makers get to the house and they enter with joy and excitement and anticipation and then they saw the young child with mary his mother and even that is significant not they saw the mother mary and her child right whenever you read the scriptures it's always they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down. And that Greek word proskune means they lay flat in their face and uh, prostrate and they worshipped him. These grown men worshipping this child because they had found the king. And then they opened their treasure and they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And imagine that glorious moment as those pagan astrologers and superstitious astronomers stepped into the house and they lay eyes on the king for the very first time. And imagine with me how their hearts must have been thumping in their chests, how their adrenaline must have been pumping through their veins, how their eyes must have been wide open in awe as the word became flesh and dwelt amongst them. And as John goes on in his letter, verse 14 of chapter 1, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Talk about joy incomprehensible. Talk about joy uncontainable. Talk about joy unspeakable. Talk about an exceedingly great joy. From the angels herald heralding great joy in Luke chapter 2 and verse 10 before the shepherds to the wise men rejoicing with exceedingly great joy. Friends, do you get that? From the face of the earth all the way to the heights of the heavens, all of creation was engulfed in great joy. I'm not sure if you're engulfed in great joy this morning, right? But I know that back then all of creation was. And the scriptures say in Luke chapter 2 and verse 10, when the angels appear to the shepherds, it is a great joy which will be to who? To the Jews? To the wise men? To the shepherds? It'll be a great joy to... Come on, you can do it. All people, right? It'll be great joy to all people, Jews and Gentiles, men and women, boys and girls, black, white and brown, wise men and fools, laymen and laity, plumbers and presidents, beggars and billionaires. Great joy has come to the whole world, every tongue, every tribe, every nation, and exceedingly great joy erupting and reverberating in Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth. It is a great joy, joy that is greater than pain, joy that is greater than suffering, joy that is greater than fear, joy that is greater than brokenness, joy that is greater than despair, joy that is greater than grief. And my dear friends, here's the exceedingly great news of good news. Great joy of good news, joy that is greater than sin. From Bethlehem's cradle to Calvary's cross, we see this exceedingly great joy. It is a joy which cannot be equaled. It is a joy which cannot be rivaled. It is a joy which cannot be extinguished because it is a joy which is too wide and too high and too far and too deep for even death itself. It is that exceedingly great joy which came from heaven's hallways to earth's pathways through the God-man Jesus. It is a joy that will go to the end of the age, even into eternity. It is a joy which is cheering us on in our suffering, which is comforting us in our brokenness, 
tenderness, which is embracing us in our frailty, which is sustaining us in our weaknesses. It is an exceedingly great joy until that day of no more pain and no more sorrow and no more suffering and no more heartache and no more death. Somebody, please say amen. amen. An exceedingly great joy. That's the gift which Jesus brought for you and I. He brought joy. Do you know the joy of Jesus today? Maybe you've been looking in all the wrong places for joy. The world can give you happiness. The world cannot give you joy. Joy in my circumstances. Joy despite my circumstances. Joy in Jesus. You see, when we get Jesus, we get joy. That's why the scriptures talk about the joy of the Lord is my strength. And as we come to a close this morning, and as we gaze into the mirror of God's word, I end where I began. Can joy really be found? And as we've journeyed with these wise men, there is a resounding yes. There is an exceedingly great joy because of the birth of Jesus Christ, the Savior. And I recognize, my dear friends, that Christmas can be a painful time for some because of heartache, because of hardships, because of the absence of loved ones, because of great trials and injustices, because of shattered dreams and broken promises. But the exceedingly great joy which the God-man Jesus brought is greater than anything which causes our hearts pain because it is a joy unspeakable. It is a joy which is eternal in Jesus Christ. My dear friends, Jesus came for you. Jesus came for me and he brought exceedingly great joy. And I ask you this morning, where do you find your joy? In whom or what do you find your joy? Is it in friendships? Is it in marriage? Is it in relationships? Is it in work? Is it in wealth? Is it in possessions? Where do you find your joy? Because only Jesus can give you a joy that lasts forever. A joy that is complete. A joy that never fades. A joy that is not based on circumstances but on Christ. A joy that goes into eternity. A joy for all people. A joy for all circumstances. For the broken, look to Jesus for joy. For the hurting, look to Jesus for joy. For the depressed, look to Jesus for joy. For the despairing, look to Jesus for joy. For the lonely, look to Jesus for joy. For the sick, look to Jesus for joy. For the anxious, look to Jesus for joy. Because heaven came near in the God-man Jesus. And he invites us to draw near to him, to rest in him, to find your exceedingly great joy in him, and to live for Jesus every single day until that day, as the Apostle Paul describes to the church at Corinth, when Jesus will pull back the curtain and allow us to gaze in as angels long to gaze, when we with unveiled face will behold the glory of our wonderful Savior, Jesus. Imagine that joy. When eventually our joy will become full, when our joy will become complete, to have the curtain of heaven pulled back, and Jesus says, come and have a look in. What a great joy, what a great day that is going to be. My dear friend, if you're listening or watching this morning and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus, I implore you, 
Would you come to Jesus today? Let it not be said of you as it was said of so many in Jerusalem at that time that he came to his own and his own received him not. But let, let it rather be said of you, my dear friend, if that's you today, that as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Will you receive Jesus today and find joy complete? Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father, I pray that you would give us a fresh revelation and a fresh glimpse at this exceedingly great joy. Joy unspeakable. Joy uncontainable. Inexplainable. Thank you that this was one of those gifts that you brought when you came to earth. Joy that is greater than all of our sin. Joy that calls us forgiven. Joy that calls us sons and daughters of the Most High God, loved by the King and forgiven. Joy that draws us into relationship with you, Jesus. Joy that takes us heavenward. Joy that sustains and empowers, enables and equips us through the valleys and the mountaintops of life until one day with unveiled faces we behold the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. And I pray, Lord, that we would know this joy. And Father, I ask that you would forgive us if we have been looking for joy in all the wrong places because only Jesus can give us this kind of joy. And my Father, if there is someone listening or watching this morning who has never surrendered their life to you, I pray that they would this day come running like a prisoner set free fall at your feet, call on your name, receive your forgiveness, declare you as Lord, and that they might know that exceedingly great joy poured out on sinners by a wonderful Savior. My dear friend, if that's you, will you give your life to Jesus today? Because only Jesus can satisfy the deepest longings of the souls of men. Thank you for this joy. Thank you that it isn't only the Magi who get to hold on to the secret. But that joy is ours through the person of Jesus Christ. As we get into this Advent season, Father, I pray that we would celebrate you right. I pray that we would celebrate you with reverence and with honor and with fear. And I pray, Lord, that we would know this joy that has come to the world for all people who will call upon the name of Jesus. For your name's sake and your kingdom's cause. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And amen. Shall we stand and sing praise to our joy giver?
Heavenly Father, how can our hearts not be full of your joy when you have brought us pure joy, you have brought us your light, your salvation, that you would come down to earth and die for us so that we can have hope and joy. And I pray that as we go out now and into our week and home to our families, that your light would fill us, that your spirit would overflow within us, that we would pour joy into the lives of others because we are filled with your joy. And so I pray that you would do that for us this week, that we wouldn't leave here untouched, unchanged, but that we would go out and live your joy in our lives. Amen.